Cool. So I'm Sean Dietrich. I'm an artist. Uh, that's my art. That's the caterpillar in his mushroom lounge, as I like to call it. And I'm going to kind of go around <clears throat> and talk about um, kind of what it's like to dive into Alice and put together images for a book that 600 million other artists have uh, attempted and put out. Um, I'm going to start by giving kind of a background of where I came from and how I got into art and my process, because that translates, you know, hope you guys, uh, or help me translate to you guys how I actually put kind of art like that together. And um, so the book itself, I was approached by uh, Nate Murray. He uh, used to be the head of uh, business development for IDW Comics. And he originally approached me about doing The Wizard of Oz and then found out that Alice fans actually care about collecting the book. And Oz people just want merch. You know? so, like, <clears throat> He did his research, you know, like, he went to a bunch of Oz fests and all that, you know, not like Ozzy Osbourne, but, you know, like, um, so yeah, so that's how I kind of got connected with the book, uh, as far as illustrating it. Obviously, it was one of the earliest books that I had uh, been given as a child, and as far as the whole artistic process, um, I told my mom when I was four I was going to be an artist when I grew up. And I'm 47 now, so I didn't uh, stray from that path. It was always something I wanted to do. I came from a not creative family. Um, my dad is a software engineer for the CIA. My uncle was a principal engineer for Northrop Grumman. And uh, my aunt does computer security for WorldCom and AT&T. They didn't understand anything about that. <laughs> um, but I did have a mother who was very, very super creative and supportive, and my earliest memories are probably 1979, 80. She had me doing cross-stitching, macrame. We would watch Soul Train and dance and eat TV dinners, and so that was kind of the beginning of my artistic freedom and how I got into uh, to being an artist. So um, when I got into high school, um, this was mid-90s, so we didn't actually have computers to use for the uh, magazine that we put out. So we, I was part of the school magazine. And so I used their equipment to self-publish uh, my first comic book at 15. And we, uh, I would give copies out to my friends, and they would walk through the hallway just holding them up. And they would be like, kids would be like, what's that? Well, Dietrich's new comic, two bucks. <laughs> and just sell it. And it was a... Uh, Wonderful story about a teenager <clears throat> with an Uzi in New York chasing a cannibal from the Amazon. <laughs> Two issues, sold 400 copies uh, through the high school, and the local comic book store would let me set up on New Comic Book Day and actually sell comics as the people came in. So, so I've always been interested in illustrating books and uh, obviously weird ones as well. So Alice fit right in there. And then... Um, I started getting into comic books and wanted to do superheroes. It was a time in the 90s when like Todd McFarlane and Image Comics came out and there was that huge where everybody speculated, you know, oh, we're going to buy 5,000 copies of this book and it's going to pay for my kid's college. And, and then MTV came into my life and I started, uh, two weeks out of the summer I got to go hang out with my grandparents in Maryland and they would let me watch as much MTV as I wanted to, my parents not so much. Um, my grandma also would make me give her a list of all the parental advisory lyric albums that I wanted that my parents wouldn't buy me and she would go buy them for me. <laughs> this is uh, like, so I definitely, grandma was very cool. <laughs> um, and that included trips to the comic book store as well. So, um, but getting into watching 120 Minutes, Headbangers Ball, like some of the darker music, my art started to change a little from superheroes to more of the um, kind of darker art. And then um, when I was 18, um, I got into a fight with my dad and he was like, he gave me an ultimatum to uh, do something or leave by Sunday. And at that time I was doing cartoons. I had my first magazine job with a music magazine in Virginia and I was doing editorial cartoons for him. 
and they were printing some of my comic books as well. So uh, I said, okay. So I called up the magazine editor, and he had a big house out in the forest, and that's where like most of the people that worked on the magazine lived as well. Um, they were in their early 20s, mid 20s. It was a big party house. I knew nothing. I lived in upper white suburbia. I was so I showed up that weekend. He had a big party. I said, "Oh, this is what adult life is." I'm like, "Sign me up." So that quickly changed. <laughs> but I did move out when I was 18, and I ended up um, moving into New Orleans and um, spent three years there from 1996 to 98. Um, or a couple years in Pittsburgh before that, and then New Orleans. I met a buddy from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We spent one winter in Pittsburgh, and I said, enough of that shit. And uh, I said, where do I go? And he's like, you should just move to New Orleans. And I said, okay. So my friend and I showed up, I think with 250 bucks between us. We had a $50 a month apartment. It was 6.30 a.m. in a Greyhound station, and I called the landlord, and he was like, oh, I didn't think you were coming. We got rid of that. So. We remember reading an article about the gutter punks that lived on the river walk in New Orleans. So we went and hunted them down, <clears throat> and they taught us all about living uh, on the streets of New Orleans. Thankfully, it was only about a month before I found work. Um, but I did end up, uh, for about 30 days, I lived in an abandoned dress factory. So it was something they all, the gutter punks snuck into, they would squat there. Um, but I can tell you that as far as if you're looking through the book and you see the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, seeing all the sewing implements and all the cloth and whatnot, that was something I definitely pulled from my memory to you know, put into the book. So um, it's one of the reasons I'm kind of going in depth on my history here as an artist, because it really has to do with you know, not how technically proficient I am as an artist, but what I've seen. And I think that makes for a much better you know, artist, in my opinion. Um, and especially the culture in New Orleans. I, um, like I said, I grew up in Northern Virginia and just outside Baltimore is where I was born. Pretty upper white middle class life. Ketchup was the only spice I knew. Um, so, you know, once I got to New Orleans and was immersed in black culture and jazz and music and really learned that, um, holy crap, there's a whole other world out there. It really influenced my artwork as well. And um, it's one of the reasons I like, like hyper detailed art. Um, and putting as much like research as I do into the uh, the artwork as well. Um, let's see. From New Orleans, I moved to San Diego, and ended up uh, going into full culture shock there. Because if you live in New Orleans and then move to San Diego, and it's 6:30 a.m. again at a Greyhound station, and you walk outside, and the sun seems twice as bright, and there's people jogging and weird stuff like that, and uh, <laughs> Um, but there I kind of started working on my first comic book and got my first professional gig and then got introduced to the San Diego Comic Con so I started doing that. I, was a, um, I had a booth there for about 17 years and ended up getting picked up by PlayStation and worked on a Twisted Metal game. Um, but the one big thing I did there was I started getting into live art so I had my first comic book out and then it was an indie book, so I didn't really have a way to promote it. You know, the publisher even, it's how I actually got back into painting. I used to do a lot of black and white art. And then he said, you need a full color cover. And I said, well, go hire somebody. And he's like, that's not how indie comics work. He's like, you, you're doing it. So, <clears throat> and as far as a, um, a budget for promotion, he was like, you know, it's, it's basically, there's one big catalog that goes out to the comic stores and you hope they all pick it up and then your book takes off. So. Um, so what I would do is I had a lot of friends that were DJs, so I would be like, where are you spinning tonight? And I would set up a canvas and do live art at the nightclub. And that grew into something where, for, I think from 99 to, I still do it today at major music festivals, but I've done well over, I think, 4,000 different events. So there was a time where it was six nights a week for about four years I was out at a club in either San Diego or LA trying to kind of get my work out there and get my name out there. So. Um, and of course, a lot of that, you're meeting pretty incredible characters and people, and you know, you get to meet some of the, the living versions of uh, the Alice characters. <laughs> you know, like, um, and yeah, from the, the live painting, it, it, I got into like, uh, I did get connected with festivals, so now I travel around. I actually 
hop between here and Australia, and I do major music festivals. So my voice is a little messed up right now. I just got off the road. I'm six weeks on the road, two months on the road, actually. I just got done doing eight festivals, so yelling for 11 hours a day over the music. Um, but it's fun. I get to sell art and live paint in front of 180,000 people and a uh, little bit bigger in this crowd. <laughs> um, and when I got into the festivals, it, it's one of the reasons I wanted to do the Alice book as well. I realized, especially with social media, like I, I'm, I'm not a fan of selling art online. I, I love doing it in person. I love, you know, actually committing to conversation with people and showing them my art and explaining the stories behind them. And so when I realized that I had this, you know, this is my 13th year doing these music festivals, that I had this fan base built up. And when my publisher asked me to do, like, do you want to put out your own version of Alice? We're looking to do a bunch of classic books. We'd love, we've seen your Alice stuff. We'd love you to do it. I said, yeah, actually, that'd be really cool. Because I know that the crowd that I already have built up at these festivals, they're all families, you know, they're ones that I saw 10 years ago that came and now they have kids that they're bringing to the music festivals and I'm like, what better book? There, there really is no better book. So I was like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, and so as far as the, uh, I'll read you a little excerpt here from what I put online when we did the Kickstarter for the, uh, the Alice project just so I can kind of give you a little backstory as to why I did it. Um, it says, uh, if you know me as an artist, you know I paint with a strong purpose. And for those who don't know me, this is your first bit of insight into how I take the paintings and projects that I do on. I don't paint for painting's sake anymore, nor do I find joy in just the process. That feeling left me a long time ago, right around the time my mind finds itself in a state of endless ideas. Awesome problem to have. I'm also one to lovingly mourn the past quite frequently in my work, letting me journal my love for all things that were so much cooler but have gone to the grave or have been replaced by the future. One thing that does survive and connects me to the past are books, and one insane world in those books has always held a special place is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I think at the time, 2022 was like the 150-some anniversary of this tale, and to think that while the U in the U.S. we were just coming out of the terrors of the Civil War trying to figure out if our frail nation was going to survive, after so much destruction, the world was also about to get its first taste of a hookah smoking caterpillar, a tea party gone mad, croquet games played with flamingos and hedgehogs and a wondrous environment all seen through the eyes of a little girl who had fallen down a hole in a very unique tree. Obviously the book has gone on to be republished over the last century and a half as well as been turned into just about every form of media and merchandise that's out there and for good reason. The characters themselves were so unlike what was out at the time and if we look at what's being offered up nowadays, they still make a difference. The characters were from a children's book, but were of a certain reality that adults don't offer children. There's a brutal honesty about the caterpillars, who are you, where we see that he really doesn't have time for BS. He wants to know what you have to make his life better or how fast you can go away. <laughs> we love that we can dress up as the Mad Hatter at a costume party, turning into the characters more boozes consume because we start to sway more violently through the night and our mind mimicking what it must be like to carry on obnoxiously swatting sanity away like a mosquito, a Cheshire cat that fades in and out of reality, a queen with a powerful lust for decapitation, and a white rabbit that runs around like most of us in society, screaming about being late for something or another. These are the characters from our childhood that we're able to carry into adulthood. They're definitely a link to the past that comforts me, and I'm honored to play my part in bringing this book out again. As I was researching the past editions, I wanted to familiar myself with, with as many editions as possible to make sure I didn't replicate too closely another art style or design, I found an edition by Ralph Steadman, an artist that illustrated Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas for Hunter Thompson, an author I'm a huge fan of. Not knowing one of my favorite artists created an edition of the book, it made it all more worth it to pursue my version so that I can place the two books on my bookcase side by side, which I have now. And I have the Salvador Dali edition too, up there too. Uh, bridging the years and generations of talent. It made me feel like I was illustrating a legacy and not just a book. As I poured through the years of books, one thing that struck me was a lack of really vibrant colors in some of the illustrated versions. I know with the older editions, the printing process sometimes couldn't capture the vibrancy of the original art, but even in modern times, some of the versions of Alice just seemed to be lacking in what I would consider an intense opportunity to make some face-melting art. 
<laughs> even the two live action movies from Tim Burton seemed to lack a vividness in a life. I felt if someone filmed the movie and then applied a wash of black paint over it, it is Tim Burton, but um, I really wanted to turn up the color and intensity of the book and hope I've achieved success. And last but not least, it's one of the few all ages projects I've worked on, which is, uh, which was pretty important. I have a lot of little cousins and little ones starting to, my, they're growing up and starting to have kids now. And so it was really cool to have um, something all ages um, to, to get out there to them. Um, so as far as the process, you know, about me now. Um, so I have a painting I did called Prone to Victory. And it's, it's a great example of how I jump into stuff. Um, you can see an image of it on my website or whatnot. But my buddy John came to me and he, his grandpa stormed Normandy and fought all the way to Germany and lived and came back and ended up living to be well into his late 80s. Um, so this painting took about five years of research and about 200 hours to paint. But it's, you know, so kind of what I'll do as far as, um, especially with like the Alice book too, is I'll, I, I think I looked at over 60 different editions of Alice and said, okay, this is how everybody else is drawing these characters. And um, it's one of the reasons I use like the dragon's head caterpillar for him. It's one of the most common caterpillars in all temperate regions across the world. And I figure, well, if Wonderland's everywhere, let's pick a caterpillar that looks unique, but is also like accessible to most kids, you know. And, um, and then I'll start doing like versions, you know, sketches. This is what everybody else will do, and then kind of push it over and be like, how you know, um, especially with the first page in that book where it's uh, it's an illustration of a tree. Everybody draws her falling down the hole, but what I did is you see the rabbit ears coming out of the tree. It's like that moment before she jumps. So it was a matter of going in and being like, okay, how do I not make it? I mean, first thing you do is you print out everything Disney did and you pin it on your wall and you say, don't do that. You know, like, get their lawyers out of the way and then you're good to go. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, with um, John's painting, you know, this is a tribute to his grandpa. So I was like, well, I don't want to do just some dreary World War II painting, you know, him leaning against a tank or something like that. So as we, I read about the battles, it wasn't more about like what he had seen. It was the fact that like I haven't gone to war and what does that feel like and how surrealistic that must feel. And you see shows like the Pacific and Band of Brothers and wonder what they went through. So um, I thought surrealism would be a great way to go about it. So I went and animalized all the weapons. So like the MG42 machine gun mosquitoes and the Higgins way, uh, landing crafts or whales. So it's this like fantasy look at you know, kind of what his grandpa went through, but turning it into like this massive, like it's a six foot by four foot piece. It hangs in his living room and it's a conversation piece. So when people come in, they're obviously like, what is that? And then he gets to talk about his grandpa. So, and then in the hedgerows at the bottom, I did a little portrait of his grandpa. So, um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it can take, like it took about two years to do all the 24 illustrations in the book um, for Alice. Um, you know, and another analogy is, you know, for instance, just to give you guys something visual to think of, suppose you have, you've seen a lot of still lifes, obviously, in art galleries. Um, let's say it's a vase of flowers and a tall drink and an orange or something like that. Most artists would show you just that. Some then might go, okay, let's show you the light source, maybe some candles or a window or whatnot, and that's typically what we see in a still life. And the way I would look at it is, you know, why not frame it as if you were small looking out from the flowers and the cocktails, maybe the, or the drink is a, is a waterfall and then the glass looks like a hill and maybe the candles are like the sunset or whatnot. So kind of fleshing it out to where it comes from like more of a fantastical way to, to look at the artwork. Um, uh, one of the weirder comparisons, when I was researching the Alice editions, I was watching Ridley Scott's Alien, and bear with me. <laughs> um, one thing that really, I, I was thinking about it, because I, I used to watch a lot of old movies with my wife's grandpa, and you know, if you look at Alice and you look at Ripley from Alien, there's, there's a huge history of film and literature where there's not many powerful women like that. It's a lot of the woe is me, get me off the train track, you know, kind of. Um, that's why the first black and white illustration in there, if you look at the, in the book, if you look at the, uh, 
the lanterns hanging from the ceiling. They look like H.R. Giger's uh, alien eggs. So a little, little tribute, tribute to Ridley there. Um, but there was a lot of comparisons I was seeing. I was watching it um, in a hotel room on tour once, and I was like, I, that just reminds me of Alice so much. She's like in this very different place, and the creatures aren't as nice. But, um, but yeah, go watch that movie and then read the book. <laughs> That's your Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, Oz moment. <laughs> um, and then for the Hatter, uh, it was cool because constructing the scene with the, the tea party, I, like in the book, he's actually eating, a, uh, I made needle cake and, and thimble pie, and like all his sewing implements were stuck in the batter and stuff like that. And that's what I thought, you know, when I was figuring out that um, painting, I was like, you know, what is he going to be eating? And let's say if he does all the cooking, maybe it's... Uh, you know, he's just so covered in all this stuff that he uses, like it's falling in the batter, and then he ends up with these cakes and these, you know, crumpets and stuff like that that have um, things that shouldn't be in there. Um, I think the other one was maybe he had a personal chef, but he would hover over this dude so much that he would uh, drop stuff in it while this guy's trying to make stuff for his uh, his tea party. So part of the process also is going, okay, there's there's a scene in Alice, but how do I... You know, writers do it a lot when they come up with a character, obviously, for a book. They write out a whole history, even though if this guy's in it for two seconds, at least it's more believable, you know, when you're writing that character because you, you have a connection with them because you know this person's whole story. Um, so with a lot of the characters, it was a, a way of kind of expanding past um, what you just see in the book. Um, and as far as, uh, I mean, the book's out now. It came out last September, I believe. We sold through our first 500 first editions. Um, I have a few with me. Um, and then um, the feedback's been awesome. My wife actually just sent me a card we got in the mail today. Somebody had gotten their copy and, and mailed a card to me, and it was uh, appreciative. It was all hand-decorated. and. I thought that was pretty cool. Very few people actually physically mail things to you these days. <laughs> um, but the book, it's really been cool. There was, um, I get so many people that come up at these festivals when they first bought it last year and then they come up this year to the next festival and they're, you know, they, they bought it. One was an officer in Florida, bought it and gave it to his kid and just how happy his kid was and, uh, you know, I just, was like it feels good, you know, when you get something out there like that, and um, and it does exactly what it's uh, intended to do. So, um, that's about all I got for you um, as far as the process and whatnot. If you guys have any questions or get the mic up here. <laughs> oh, we got one. All right, hold on. Um. Just uh, wondering, since you have such history with comic books as well as illustrating Alice in Wonderland, have you thought of doing a comic style of Alice in Wonderland? Uh, I have, but I really hate doing comic work now. <laughs> it's so <laughs> tiny. It's, the paintings I do are so big right now. It's like I, I have a couple other graphic novels that are written, but I'm going to source artists for them. I'll do the cover art, but yeah. I. I had thought about it, but then it was like, oh, I got to sit down and draw that tiny again, and then it's framed. So, unless I blow it up, like do pages that are six feet tall, it's not out of the question. I won't rule anything out, but um, um, it's yeah, it's not in the future. I am, I am. My publisher does want me to work on kind of my own version of Alice or take the character somewhere. So I'm, I'm fleshing out a book called Sugar Cube right now where I'm taking the characters out of Wonderland and putting them in Reno in the 50s, and they're going to run the Wonderland Hotel and Casino. <laughs> so if you can imagine like Scorsese's Mean Streets or Mickey Rourke and Barfly meets Alice, that's kind of what we're, you know, I didn't know if I was supposed to spill that, but whatever. <laughs> or what you guys thought of it. <laughs> but, yeah. I have two one-off questions. Sure. Did you get stuck in the mud? In the mud. At Burning Man? Oh, I wasn't at Burning Man. Oh, I thought you were. No, oh. you, you can't sell anything at Burning Man. I won't show up oh, there. Okay. No, I didn't. I, <laughs> I had friends that went, though, and they got stuck in the mud. Got it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually, I was wondering, given your age, if you, mm -hmm. as a child, were uh, influenced with Garbage Patch Kids and... Oh, Garbage Pail Kids. Pail. Yeah. Oh, I had a collection. Garbage yeah. Pail. Because that, my comics, and everything else that went in the garbage. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but it, it quite evo it evokes... 
Yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, as far yeah, I mean, as far as my influences, uh, Norman Rockwell and, and like the grotesque. I mean, he did some caricature. You know, and Spiegelman. yeah. Um, I, I learned to paint by watching Bob Ross on TV, honestly. <laughs> so Happy Trees turned into that. You know, and uh, um, and then like yeah, H.R. Giger and and then Tom McFarlane, Sam Keith. Um, uh, Helen Wine is one of my favorite artists of all time, um, but yeah. Well, I just wanted to commend you for your entrepreneurship. It's really kind of amazing how you um, started from scratch and made a real career um, that's followed what you want to do. I think that's lovely. Could you Thank share you. with us the backstory of the mock turtle? And that's my question. The backstory of the mock turtle? Oh, the illustration? Yeah. I was like, you read the book, you know. <laughs> um, so the, when I was painting the mock turtle, I was streaming it live on Twitch, and I had a bunch of people watching, and I'm like, what am I gonna do with this shell? That's why it's all tattooed up. So all the people that were watching, I said, if you got a cool tattoo, upload it to my Discord. And so the, the quill pen down the middle is actually one of the artists I mentor in Memphis right now, so I was like, I knew he had that tattooed here, and I said, well, I'll put that there. And a few of the others are from people that uploaded their tattoos. So I was like, I'll put you in the book. And, you know, just kind of immortalizes them in that moment that we had, you know, all together online. And I love doing stuff like that, though, like hiding little Easter eggs and whatnot. So. Was that Kickstarter at the higher levels? You got your tattoo in the book? No. You just, <laughs> that was while I was working. That was pre-Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> Mark? Now here comes the big guns. <laughs> Sorry to bring up uh, technique, but can you tell yeah. me a little bit about uh, what you draw with? Is much of a digital, things like that? Sure. Um, I don't do any digital. Uh, it's all canvas, uh, acrylic on canvas. And the, uh, I don't use black paint. That's a Japanese ink called Holbein. Um, it works way better on canvas. I can work a lot quicker. And like all those little fine lines, that's like a zero liner brush, like a couple human hairs. Um, but it definitely allows me to um, kind of get into the tooth of the canvas a lot better. Thank you. Yeah. What size are the originals? Uh, they're 18 by 24. Yeah. And they all hang on the wall in my studio right now. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Huh? I saw they were for sale. Million bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Can't separate them. Got to buy them all. <laughs> yeah, they're. Uh, they're pretty important, so if I sell them, they're gonna. I'm, I'm quitting art. No, no, no. no, I'll never do that. Um, thank um, you, I appreciate I have, it. I have a last question. Oh, we got a question. How long about that. would something like that take? Like, how long? Oh, how much time um, would you spend? each one took about 12 to 15 hours of painting. That's uh, it? Just the painting, the sketching. Okay. I probably did six months of character research and doing. I have a whole stack of pencil sketches of what the characters, eventually I'll upload them on my social media or so website. So that's the conceptual part. Yeah. But so the I'll do actual the, art takes only 12 to 15 yeah, hours. Wow. Yeah. Because I, I get it pretty, like the pencil rendering looks almost like that. And then, so I, I spend the time doing, you know, there could be another like eight to 10 hours in just the pencils. Um, just so when I do transfer it to the canvas, it's exactly how I want. Um, I'll pick out the color palette too, um, kind of depending on you know, um, I mean, most of it is pretty cohesive. It's yellows and oranges. There is the one picture of the Victorian house where she's stuck in it and kicking the lizard out of the uh, chimney. That that's actually my favorite piece I did for the book, but a little bit different than the other um, the other ones. But yeah, they all took uh, about twelve to fifteen hours of just the painting. You know. Any other questions? Thank you very cool. much, Sean. That's Appreciate great. it. Thank you, guys. Yeah.